serial killers who hunted under the cover of war. It is a common saying that war is hell, however it turns out that the existence of war provides the ideal cover for engaging in an activity that is just as horrible, the commission of serial murders. Where did all these monstrosities originate? The anarchy and distractions brought about by war provided the ideal cover for a small number of serial killers who killed not in the name of a cause or country, but rather for the thrill of it. Imagine living in the middle of World War II, not knowing when you or your loved ones will be drafted, not knowing who will return, not knowing how food was going to be made to the table, and then hearing rumors of a killer stalking the night. That would be terrifying. Hey folks, welcome back to Crime Point. In this video, we are going to find out about the haunted serial killers. Let us dive right in. And before we begin, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon so you don't miss out on any of our amazing videos. And let's begin! Let's put those murderers, along with others like them, who hunted under the guise of war in the spotlight. Paul Orgazal, the S-Bahn Murderer The S-Bahn is a railway system that runs through Berlin. During the very darkest times of World War II, literally, it was the dumping ground for a serial killer who stalked the city during the blackouts that were designed to foil Allied bombers. The blackouts were designed to prevent Allied bombers from reaching their targets. Late in 1940, authorities uncovered the first bodies, but the murders continued unabated. A number of victims were injured when they were hurled from moving trains. The majority of them had fractured skulls and displayed signs of having been assaulted. According to BBC Collections, which was obtained via issue, Berlin police became aware that they were dealing with a single killer as more victims were identified. They had a hunch that it was one of the railroad workers, but zeroing in on the culprit was like looking for a needle in a haystack that contained more than 5,000 workers. Once all the victims had been found in July of 1941, there was one name that stood out above the rest, Paul Orgazal. His co-workers routinely accused him of being a misogynist, and four of the eight women who were murdered were discovered within one mile of his residence. Orgazal was eventually apprehended, and after confessing to having committed the murders, he was put to death by guillotine. Orgazal hunted under the cover of blackouts and used the darkness to escape police pursued at least once. In retrospect, it appears as though he should have been caught well before he killed his eighth victim. However, he did both of these things. Additionally, for a considerable amount of time, the possibility of a German serial killer was not even on the radar of the police. Instead, they focused their attention on the local Jews, foreign laborers, and the possibility that British agents were present in the region. Marcel Petiot, Dr. Satan. It's safe to say that Ted Bundy did not come up with the concept of the charming and charismatic serial killer all by himself. Take Marcel Petiot as an example. According to David King, a historian and author who based his book Death in the City of Light on Petiot's story, here's a guy, obviously very intelligent, charismatic, has a respected position, is into collecting antiques, interested in the arts, he seemed like the nicest guy. In order for King to piece together Petio's story, it took him years of research, and the basics are presented here. It started in occupied Paris, where a large number of people desperately wanted to escape the Nazi boot heel, but had few options available to them. Petio, a well-known physician in Paris, went in search of people who were trying to escape the city and lied to them, saying that he was a member of the underground resistance in France. After he had lured his victims into his home with the promise of helping them to freedom, he then had them write letters to loved ones saying that they were escaping and that everything was completely fine. After that, he administered an injection that he said was a vaccine, but which was, in all likelihood, not one at all. The victims' bodies were then dismembered, set on fire, and scattered across the courtyard of one of his residences. Eddie Leonsky, the Brownout Strangler when women started turning up dead in Melbourne, Australia the morning after brownouts, which were similar to other blackouts during World War II but less severe, it wasn't long before witnesses came forward claiming to have seen the women with an American GI. The witnesses were absolutely correct. Franklin D. Roosevelt stepped in to protect and reinforce Australia in the face of the conflict that was raging in the Pacific after Britain declined to do so. According to The Guardian, Private Eddie Leonsky, a native of New Jersey with a personal as well as family history of violent behavior, substance abuse, and mental illness, was among the 250,000 troops that deployed. People who had served with him in the military knew him to be an angry drunk who craved attention, and in Australia, he did not change his ways. It didn't take long for Leonsky's reputation to make him a person of interest after the third body was found strangled and in various states of undress. This was after the discovery of a third body. He admitted his guilt and explained that he had done it in an effort to silence the voices. He reported to the authorities, She was singing in my ear. It appeared as though she was singing to me specifically. I grabbed her. She stopped singing at that point. 
After going through the process of a court-martial in the United States military, where he was found guilty, Leonsky was ultimately executed by hanging after his request for an appeal was turned down. Rudolf Pleel, the Dead Maker According to the Center for European Studies, by the year 1946, German citizens were still divided along a demarcation line that was defended by either American, Soviet, French, or British troops. Families were torn apart, and it should not come as a surprise that they desired to reunite with their loved ones. Then along came Rudolf Pleel, with the assurance that he could bring separated members of families back together again on the other side of the border. Das Erste claimed that his chosen method of murder has been successful on multiple occasions, just as it was with Gertrude Glode. The widow, who was 44 years old at the time, desired to travel to the East Coast so that she could organize her paperwork and begin a new life with the members of her family who were still alive. She retained Plell, but she was never heard from again. Plell pretended to be a guide at the border, but instead of escorting his charges across the border, he lured him to an isolated area, attacked them, and then killed them. In spite of the fact that he was detained by border patrols on numerous occasions, he was always allowed to continue on his way, until 1947. After that, an axe that had been found next to the dismembered body of a German merchant was traced back to Pleel, and it wasn't long before he was arrested and eventually confessed to 26 separate murders. Pleel, who was serving a sentence of life in prison at the time of his death in 1958, took his own life. And what should we make of Glode? Her body was found at the bottom of a well that was located not more than a mile and a half away from her house, where her daughter continued to wait for her. Arthur Shawcross, the Monster of the Rivers Arthur Shawcross was known by a number of aliases, including the Genesee River Killer, the Rochester Strangler, and the Monster of the Rivers. These names were given to him in proportion to the number of people he murdered. They were right on the mark. According to Thought Co., Shawcross was ultimately connected to 14 homicides that occurred in and around the Rochester, New York area. What's the worst of it? The majority of these could have been avoided altogether. In 1972, Shawcross was responsible for the deaths of two children. In 1987, he was granted parole for good behavior and went on to be responsible for the deaths of at least 11 more children. That's terrible, but where does all the killing during wartime fit in? According to Peter Vronsky, an author and expert researcher on serial killers, one of the reasons he was paroled in the first place was because he claimed to be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. This information was obtained from Oxygen. He claimed that the traumatic experiences he had while serving his country in Vietnam were one of the primary factors that led to his subsequent killing sprees. Shawcross, who was also responsible for cannibalizing several of his victims, stated that he had not only begun killing people in Vietnam, but that it was also the place where he first developed a taste for the flesh of other people. Even though it hasn't been established for certain what went down with Shawcross in Vietnam, records indicate that he served in a capacity that was not directly related to combat during his deployment, the story was convincing enough to get him back out on the streets. He was found guilty yet again in 1990, and he passed away behind bars in 2008. And that brings us to the end of this video. Feel free to let us know what you think about it. And if you liked the video, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel for more great ones. And thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.